All right, welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited. Um, this is video number 63. Title of this one's going to be John David Norman. Um, also, it's what, 14 August. Now, I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible, uh, but I may take two, three videos to go through this. Just depends on what I find because I haven't actually looked at all the articles that I've pulled out. Um, so what I'll do is this Wikipedia page, I'll read it straight through. Uh, the cab dev, maybe we'll read that straight through. And then the news articles, I'll stop and read through myself. And when I find something interesting, I'll turn it back on. I'll read that part. I'll stop, go to the next thing. That way we're not spending hours reading news articles from 40, 50 years ago. Um, but anyway, so John David Norman... And just to give you a quick synopsis why I'm getting into this guy, because um, it's my belief that Wayne Williams was started off at least doing more than just auditioning these kids. Okay, He already had his Gemini group, his Gemini 5, according to Jimmy Howard, like 1978, and maybe even 77. So why is he still auditioning these children? And the, all these guys were like 16, 17, 18 years old. So why is he auditioning children under 15 years old for his group that he already has together? It doesn't make any sense. And also it doesn't make any sense that he's spending $500 a month at least just on studio time at Shadow Lawn to audition kids for an album that he never produces, for a group that never tours, for a group that never goes to any musical uh, contests or clubs, never makes any money. But yet for four years, he's able to spend four, $500 plus a month doing these things. So there's got to be something else going on. And I, I submit that it was child pornography. I think that he was using... Okay, his Nova Entertainment Gemini, supposedly Gemini group, as a dangle to hang out there to get kids to come to him. Okay, because if he was going around to little elementary schools hanging out, hey, you want to be famous, you want to be in some pictures, stuff like that, going to churches, people would think that's kind of weird. So he needed a legitimate sounding front which was this Nova Entertainment oh can you sing can you dance you know if you're between the ages of and he was real specific on the ages 10 to 14 10 to 15 you should call me and that's what they did he also put out and also think about we don't even know the amount of money he was spending on radio advertising which isn't cheap and supposedly, we're supposed to believe that his dad was fronting him all this money for the studios, for the radio advertisements, for the paper, for the flyers, for the gas to go to the schools and put out the flyers to go to the studios. And it was more than just one studio, okay? It was another studio in East Point, another one in uh, downtown Atlanta. So at least three studios he was going to. And so the, the question begs, where is he getting the money for this? And I was able to go through and look up and find out what the average Social Security check was back in 1980. It was $546. And that's average. Okay. So if back in 1980... You were a computer engineer or a rocket scientist, and you were making seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year. Your Social Security check would be a little higher than that, eight hundred dollars, nine hundred dollars. But if you were a school teacher, making fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year, your Social Security check's not going to be the average; it's going to be below average. But we're giving him the benefit of the doubt. I would say most likely his Social Security check back in nineteen eighty was about. $300. But I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and use the average, which is 546 
And if you multiply that by two, that means that he and his wife are bringing in 1092 in Social Security. And let's just say that he got real lucky and he and his wife contributed to the union pension and the pension ended up being about the same. So you're looking at about $2,000 a month, okay, for your income. And also you got to figure that he's running around taking photos for the Atlanta Daily World news magazine. So that's bringing in a little bit more income there. But you got to figure if he was living high on the hog on his Social Security and pension, he wouldn't need to be running around at 65, 66, 67 years old taking photos for the Atlanta Daily World. So, and if you figure, at minimum $500 is going out to his son for the studios, just for the studios alone, not counting the radio time, not counting the gas, not counting the money for the flyers, not counting, you know, when Williams has got to eat when he's out there. And also there's evidence he's been giving some of the children money. So the question begs, where is Wayne Williams getting the $500 to $1,000 a month if he's not getting it from his dad who's only bringing in $2,000, $2,500 a month? And that's really damn, that's a lot of money back then. So the question again, and no one ever seems to focus on this, is where is Wayne Williams getting his money to do what he's doing? And I submit that when he was running around as a stringer and he was hit and miss making money here, making money there, selling to the highest bidder for the news stations for these late night fires, murder scenes, traffic accidents and stuff like that, probably making 25, 30, 50 bucks a pop, that that wasn't enough to sustain him. But because of that, he ran into Jim Comento. Now, Jim Comento is a white guy, uh, ran this ambulance service that ran around at night, just like when Williams did. And according to this crazy guy we interviewed that he knew Jim Comento, says that Jim Comento had been arrested with child pornography in his car. So I submit to you, got no proof of it, that James Comento came across Wayne Williams and said, hey, do you know what you're doing? You could make a little extra money. And James is like, well, yeah, really, how? All those children you're interviewing, auditioning, I've got clients that'd be interested in seeing more of them. Oh, really, how? Photos, video, even more. So this is what I think happens, either through James Comento or some other person. Wayne Williams is introduced to the child pornography world and realizes really quickly he can make a lot of money doing that. That's why you see him drop out of college at the end of 1978. And he supposedly is supposed to pursue this career of these Gemini group. But that doesn't ever go anywhere. All they do is practice. They never cut a record. They never tour around. They never hit the clubs. Nothing. And the reason why is because he's busy with a child pornography ring. This is what I think. So... I wanted to get into this guy named John David Norman because I came across him in relation to, I was reading up on other serial killers and how similar they were to Wayne Williams. And I came across John David Norman just by accident. And he was a pedophile, a sex offender. He's also a child pornographer, okay? And what he was doing was using almost exactly like Wayne Williams is doing. He was exploiting children and he was creating a uh, child pornography portfolio that he shopped around to other um, sex offenders, child molesters in the country. 
Now this is exactly on a huge scale what I was saying that Wayne Williams was doing in my other videos that I was surmising, okay? That Wayne Williams eventually got, he groomed these kids, got them into modeling, you know, taking them to different areas, and then swimsuits, and then underwear, and then no clothes, and then eventually video of them, him molesting them and, you know, other things. And then, but he's using this auditioning as a portfolio to shop around to his clients through James Comento. Supposition, of course, no evidence. But through someone, because Mike Thevis is already in jail, so it can't be Mike Thevis, it could be the remnants of Mike Thevis's organization or people who knew Mike Thevis or worked with Mike Thevis in Atlanta. So what we could be looking at is sort of a rump state, you know, like Star Wars, they had the Empire, and then they had the, the New Order or the Order or whatever. It was a rump state of the, of the Empire. We could be looking at the same thing. You had Michael Thevis's Empire, Porn Empire, and then he was sent to jail, it collapses, there's other people that he worked with across the country, because he was out of Atlanta also, and maybe Jim Comento or Wayne Williams, even on his own, came upon these people, okay, and was selling his product. Remember I told you about the, when I lived in Houston, there was this dating service I came across by accident, and they had a portfolio of women there, and they were free, the women got the free portfolio, the men had to pay to contact the women, like that. So that's what I think what's going on, is that Wayne Williams is shopping, or he's taking pictures, nude pit, he's taking pictures of all these kids that come in an audition, okay? He's got a non-nude um, portfolio, booklet, catalog, whatever, He's shopping around to these clients in Atlanta and beyond. They're saying, yeah, I like that one. I want to see more of that one. Then Wayne Williams starts his grooming process. You know, hey, let's take some photos here. Let's take some photos there. Uh, try on these clothes. Let's just try some underwear. Let's try swimsuits. And then no clothes at all. And then eventually some of this leads to sex. Eventually, maybe some of them protest, and he has to end up killing them. I don't think he's a serial killer by accident, though. I think possibly it has something to do with snuff films. Possibly. Now, none of this ever comes up in the trial, but we do have hints of it that Wayne Williams, people said Wayne Williams hit on them, grabbed them, molested them, made comments to them, things like that. And so if you're just trying to when you're you've got two murders okay and you're trying to prove just the murders you don't want to confuse the jury okay so you stick to just the evidence linking Wayne Williams to the murders those two murders and all the other stuff you may have in your intelligence files your Atlanta PD files your FBI files but it never comes out in the trial Okay? I mean, why would it? You only put in there what's relevant to convicting the person and showing they did the crime. Okay? So all this may be there. It may be in FBI documents. I've got 5,000 pages of FBI documents, of which I've gone through maybe 100 pages. And that's going to take quite a while. And then we have a whole Atlanta PD warehouse of statements and interviews with witnesses and people that saw things that never came out in the trial and never came out in the news media because why would the police put that out there okay then we've got Wayne Williams and his dad burning all those photos and items in his backyard the day he after the day he got stopped on the bridge or stopped after the bridge and of course the police could do nothing about it when they searched 
that area, they knew her photos because they found the, you know, back then you took negatives and then it had like a little roll with the little holes in it. They could find the, the harder ones of that, but the photos were all destroyed. And Homer said it was just, you know, old negatives of photos that didn't come out or blurred, stuff like that. But, it, you know, it's, it's amazing how he didn't do any of that before but coincidentally did all of that that day. Anyway, so it's my contention with very little evidence right now that Wayne Williams got into child pornography. I don't think he was prostituting the kids out, although he could have been doing that very easily, setting up for clients. Atlanta's a big international airport, flying in from all over the country and even the world to have sex with the children. And there wouldn't be very much evidence of that after they had been killed and been dumped in the river. So that's my contention. This is what exactly what I was saying, that Wayne Williams is grooming children, using Nova as a front to run his portfolio, sending out his portfolio to clients, and then they were wanting more pictures, video, and then maybe even snuff films, and then maybe he was shopping some of them out, you know, at that Alamo Hotel, some hotel in Atlanta, you know, like we were reading about uh, from the list yesterday, you could have a child in a really nice hotel in downtown Atlanta, and some guy fly in from New York and be having sex with him in the hotel, okay, and no one would know about it. Nobody. Okay. So this is what Wayne Williams, I believe, was doing on a smaller scale. John David Norman was on a national scale. Hundreds of thousands of clients across the country. He did it. He would get do it, put out his portfolio, put out his client list. He'd get caught, arrested, go to court. He'd either escape on bail or he'd go to jail for a while, get out move to another state, change his name, start up the exact same thing, change the name on a massive scale, okay? Through his Delta Project, his MC Publications, and Odyssey Foundation. And he did this all the way to the day he died, okay? In 2011. So um, that's... That's why I found it fascinating with this guy. I, I don't think there's any connection between John David Norman and Wayne Williams or the Atlanta child murders. Okay, but you do see John David Norman connected with this guy, the serial killer in Houston, this uh, John Wayne Gacy in Chicago. Um, it could be that maybe he brushed up against Wayne Williams and his organization. Okay. And again, like I said, not everybody knows everything about everyone. Homer may not have had no idea that Wayne Williams is passing around child pornography or even taking photos of nude children in his room. Jimmy Howard would have had no idea what Wayne Williams would have been doing. All he knows is that he's practicing his music with Wayne Williams when he sees him. Okay? Even James Comento could be completely innocent, although I doubt it. So, again, you can compartmentalize things where people don't know exactly what's going on with one person. And how many times have we heard some guy gets caught with a crime in America and, oh, he was such a nice person, he loved dogs and he loved cats and he loved his garden, and then he, like, buried, you know, three people in the backyard and they didn't know it. I mean... Like this guy, whatever his name is in in uh, New York, that they're digging up, they're doing, you know, they're doing this radar thing that they run across the ground and looking for bodies buried in the in the backyard, in the front yard, and underneath the house because they've had experience enough, like with John Wayne Gacy and all these other serial killers. Now they know what to look for. Okay, so anyway. We're going to get into this guy, and I'm going to skim through it. And on a massive scale, this is what I think Wayne Williams is doing on a local level. 
Okay. All right, so it's John David Norman, uh, born October 13, 1927, died May 22, 2011, was an American pedophile and sex offender convicted numerous times between 1960 and 1998 on charges of child molestation and child pornography. Throughout his life, Norman operated various direct mailing services dedicated to distributing child pornography and arranging sex trafficking. And again, this is before the Internet, so you... You, you get a list of people that were interested, you keep this list, and then you send out your mailers. Like, I remember um, I used to get a couple of catalogs of, uh, like, radio equipment, and uh, what was another one I got um, for, like, uh, sci-fi, Comic-Con type stuff, equipment, back in the 90s. This is before the Internet started go in full blast and so every month I get this catalog and uh, it had their latest products there was this radio show I listened to Art Bell at night and they had this uh, electronics company on the coast of Oregon and they always, signed, they always had the latest newest best radio equipment and they would send around a catalog every month, and that's how they got people to order stuff. It was before the internet, and I get a catalog every month. This is what this guy would be doing. Okay, so to get around getting in trouble, he would send around a catalog of children in their clothing. Okay, uh, not naked. And so he would send it around, and then he would go to his client list. They would look through it, and they'd see someone they're interested in, and they would either contact him by mail or by phone or I think even telegram, whatever, and i say, hey, I'm interested in that one. Getting more, I want to see some more about that one. And that meant, okay, we have this, you know, photos for this one cost this much. And they'd have it all coded and everything, you know. Um, and then they would send in the money, they'd wire him the money, and he'd send them those photos, okay? So this is what I think was going on with Wayne Williams, except on a smaller level, is that he was shopping around these kids to his cl these clients. He was getting their information through Nova, through these auditions for Nova, and he would take pictures of them, video of them, ask for their name, their school, their, na their age, their likes, all these kinds of things. And then he'd write all that down, put it in a portfolio, shop it around to his clients. They'd say, yeah, I want to see more of that. He would start grooming the children and eventually get them into getting naked pictures. So, you know, you want to make extra money, right? They'd use these all kinds of things. You know, your, your, your mom wants that new fur coat for Christmas, right? Well, this is the way to do it. Yeah, you got to do a few things, but hey, it's worth it, right? And he would slowly get them into that. This is what... John David Norman's doing, this is what I think that Wayne Williams is doing on a smaller scale. All right, and then it says, throughout his life, Norman operated varied, uh, various direct mail services dedicated to distributing child pornography and arranging sex trafficking. Among those operations were the Odyssey Foundation, based out of Atlanta, uh, Dallas, the Delta Project, Creative Corps, and MC Publications, based out of Chicago, and Handy Andy, based out of Pennsylvania. Again, I don't know if I said this earlier, but I haven't found any connection between John David Norman and Wayne Williams, but it doesn't mean they weren't servicing the same clients or operating in the same type of environment. So it says Norman is known for his alleged links to serial killers Dean Coral and John Wayne Gacy. He was eventually arrested for the last time in August 1987 in Illinois and spent the rest of his life in state custody. He died in 2011 at age 83. So he kept doing this. Even when he got out in his 80s, he was doing the same thing. All right. Little is known about John Norman's life, particularly his childhood and teenage years. He was born October 13, 1927 in Ida, Oklahoma, and is known to have lived in California, Colorado, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Texas. He used at least 20 aliases in his life, including John Paul Norman, Steve Gurrell, Alan Hitchcock, Charles Caldwin, 
Clarence McKay and Patrick Nelson. So what he would do, he would get arrested in one state, he'd either serve some time or he's escaped from his bail, he'd move to another state, change his name or use a different name, and then start the whole thing again a year or two later, a couple of years later, he would get caught and he would hopscotch around. I don't see any evidence that he actually ended up in Atlanta or passed through Atlanta, but, you know, it doesn't take much. It's only what, um, let's see, it's a five-hour drive from Atlanta to Florida. It's about a, what, eight-hour drive from Atlanta to Miami. It's about an eight-hour drive from Atlanta to uh, Chicago, I believe, or maybe 12 hours, and about 12 hours drive to uh, New York, I believe, too. So it's not that far. Anyway, little is known about John Norman's life. Uh, teenager, he was born October 13, 1927, in Ida, Oklahoma, and is known to have lived in California, Colorado, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Texas. He used at least 20 aliases. Oh, I went over this shit already. Sorry. In 1999, Norman was declared a sexually violent predator um, by the state of California um, and committed to a Tuscadero State Hospital. His psychiatrist. Dr. James Rivas said about Norman, John is an unrepentant adult male sex offender who, in my opinion, will go to his grave without any remorse for what he had done. Norman was released from Atascadero in October 2008 under strict conditions, but soon returned to custody after handing a sexually suggested note to a 19-year-old male clerk at an El Centro grocery store. Norman was uh, recommitted to Colinga State Hospital in March 2009, where he died two years later. So, again, just like Wayne Williams, most likely this guy was molested as a child, and because he never got help as a child or as a young person, he turned that being abused into becoming an abuser, which is exactly what people do, whether it's sexual or physical abuse. If they don't get help, the abused become the abuser. It's just classic psychology, okay? And just like children of alcoholics usually become alcoholics, children of drug dealer, or drug addicts usually become drug addicts, okay? The cycle is not broken or it's very, very hard to break. Personally, I think anyone, you know, convicted of a sex crime at least three times depending on the severity, I mean, if the guy rapes some kid, you should never let him out of prison, I don't think, but if he's got child porn on his phone, whatever, you know, let him serve his time and get out, but I think three kinds of sex crimes, three times, that's it, throw him in jail, never let him out, because they're just never going to change, this guy is perfect example, he did all this all the way into his 80s, He's never going to change because the psychological damage done to him as a child will never, he'll never, because he never got help for that, he'll never change. And this is what I think, this is why sex abuse is so damaging to our society because it affects people for the rest of their lives. Unless they get help, and even if they do get help, there's still that possibility they're going to commit crimes. Okay, so three times, that's it. Throw away, the, put them in prison, throw away the key because they're just never going to change. They're never going to be able to fit in our society. And like I said, just like Wayne Williams was an apex predator, sexual predators are out there. They're stalking, they're chasing children, and they're not going to stop unless they're in prison or dead. Anyway, Norman's criminal record dates back to the 1950s where he's twice arrested for sexual um, assault. See, so very early on, he was only 20 in 1947, so in his early 20s, that's when it always starts, okay? In Houston in 1954 and 1956, so 1954 minus 1927. He was 27 years old. That's about exactly, I'm sure stuff occurred before then, but that's when it starts to come to light. But it is unknown if he was convicted of any crime in these cases. Uh, court records and some news reports indicate he was first convicted of a sex crime in 1960. 
Norman was convicted of sexual assault in California in 1963 and in federal court in 1970. See, so it's, just, it's just hopscotching from one crime to the next. You know? And it's not a matter of, is he going to commit another crime? It's just when is he going to get caught. Okay? Of sending obscene literature through the mail, he received a 15-month prison sentence from a federal judge and served time at the McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. So that would have put him getting out about 1971, 1972, and boom, again, he's right back at it in 1973, the Dallas, the Odyssey Foundation. On August 13, 1973, Dallas police raided Norman's apartment at 3716 Cole Avenue based on a tip from a man in San Francisco that he was running a homosexual prostitution ring called the Odyssey Foundation. Police seized booklets bearing the name International and containing photographs and contact information of teenage boys and young men as well as 30,000 index cards listing about between 50 and 100,000 clients located in 35 U.S. states. So there you go. This is exactly what Wayne Williams, I believe, was doing, but on a much smaller scale, okay? But you can see, this is why I'm going over this guy, because of the similarities of what I'm talking about with Wayne Williams. So essentially, he was doing exactly what I said Wayne Williams, I, prop, I believe Wayne Williams was doing, was using his Nova Entertainment auditions as a front to find the kids. He would make a portfolio, shop it around, and then he had a client list that he would send it around to, and then they would say, I want to see more of that one or that one. And then he would groom those children into doing those things. And maybe some of the children he killed because they didn't want to participate anymore. Maybe they threatened to tell or maybe he just killed them out of spite, of anger, or maybe he killed them in a, a snuff film kind of way. I mean, there's all these possibilities. And like I said, none of this would have come out in the trial of Wayne Williams for those two people he killed, because those were adults. And the prosecution would have been more focused on how his association with Wayne Williams and how Wayne Williams killed them and was responsible for that. So all these things about the children they never got into, the child prostitution rings they never got into, and also, if you're really on the conspiracy end, you could think that maybe, I, 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 I don't see how, but maybe the reason they didn't go into the child aspect, because it would have opened up all this child pornography uh, rings and would expose prominent people in Atlanta. Maybe. There's no evidence for that, but you're going to see here it could be a possibility. Now, this is, I did a whole bunch of things about QAnon, and this is exactly down the same line that QAnon was using, although QAnon was just piggybacking. It wasn't, he wasn't presenting any information new. He was just, this kind of stuff had been going on, these rumors about, you know, rich elites using children and child pornography and all this kind of stuff. The, the, the only twist with QAnon was that it was just Democrats doing it, okay? <laughs> Which is bullshit. It, it, it crosses all political lines. It's apolitical. You know, you got the former Speaker of the House, Hastert, was convicted, you know, of having paying off boys that he had had sex with when he was a teacher, all these kinds of things, and you know, and then you got uh, this congressman, Democratic congressman in uh, New York, and his computer, and so it goes across all lines. Child pornography, child exploitation is apolitical. You know, John Wayne Gacy was a, um, you know, a registered Democrat. He was helping out with the Democratic Party. You know, Wayne Williams was backed by people who were supported by the Democratic Party. Um, this guy in uh, Washington was a registered Republican and helped out with Republican campaigns, okay? This guy in Houston was a registered Republican. 
So it crosses all political lines. That's the main problem I have with the, especially now the Republicans are picking up on that QAnon narrative that it's just all Democrats that are sexually exploiting children. Just total bullshit. It crosses all political lines. Um, there are good and bad people in both parties. And you can't, you know, but it's also it's a sign of desperation. When you have no ideas, like they don't have any ideas to do anything to help people in America, the Republicans are going to paint their enemy as child molesters. Oh, you can't vote Democrat, because if you vote Democrat, then you're voting for child exploitation. That's the narrative. Total bullshit. Anyway, Dallas police, uh, Lieutenant Harold Hancock told the Chicago Tribune, in May 1977 that prominent public figures and federal employees were among the names found in Norman's client list. You remember they had, um, I don't remember if you remember this back in the 80, eight, 1980s, they had a, um, uh, they had these congressional pages, okay, and they're volunteers that come from the district of the congressman, um, where their home district is. And they're all allowed a certain amount of pages. I think it's like two or three or four or whatever. And they're all volunteers. And I I believe they're even underage. They're under like 18 or something like that. Well, there was a big scandal where some of the pages were being molested by some of the senators and some of the congressmen. And this went across all political lines. Democrats, Republicans were both caught and arrested and and tried and convicted, okay? So, again, this is another one that crosses all political lines, you know, public officials. And I I, I tell you, the thing about child sex exploitation, it all has to do with power. It doesn't have to do with sex or sexual orientation. There's no more child exploitation and uh, child abuse in the homosexual community than in the heterosexual community. It all has to do with power. And people that get into power, they like power. They want to exploit their power and use their power. And be, be, you know, I'm God. I can do whatever I want, right? This is what the attitude is. And exploiting children is part of that power ride, that euphoria that they're going on, Okay. And again, it has nothing to do... I mean, a lot of these people that were molesting children aren't homosexuals, okay? It has nothing to do with homosexuality. They're exploiting children because of power, okay? They can have power over a human being, and that gets them off. That's like a big thing for them. It has nothing to do with them, oh... I like having sex with boys because I'm a homosexual. No, it has nothing to do with that. Okay? Maybe in some sense it does, but, again, you guys, guys that are married, not closet homosexuals, straight up, you know, heterosexuals that are caught having sex and exploiting children. Male and female. It has to do with power. Okay? And... Whenever there is a, just like drugs, whenever there is a market for something, especially illicit market, where not a lot of people, there's not going to be a lot of competition because of the risk involved of getting arrested and going to prison, there's going to be a high price that people are willing to pay for that kind of stuff. And then there are going to be people that are going to be willing to take those risks of going to jail, getting arrested, maybe even dying, getting killed, so they can make that money. And this is what you have with John David Norman. This is what you have with Wayne Williams. They're providing a service to a a market that they know those people are not going to tell. They're not going to complain. They're not going to go to the attorney general and say, hey, I got, you know, I got a bad product from Wayne Williams with this kid. And, or I got a bad product from John David Norman and I want a refund, you know. They, they know their, their clients aren't going to complain. So this is why they, can, they go along with this for so long and don't get caught. 
Anyway, it says, and federal employees were among the names found in Norman's client list. Investigators sent the index cards to State Department, a fact confirmed by State Department counsel Matthew Nimitz. Nimitz uh, stated that the State Department destroyed the index cards after determining them to be not relevant to any fraud concerning a passport. Wow. Uh, Norman was charged with possessing marijuana, conspiracy to commit sodomy, and uh, contributing to the delinquency of a juvenile. He was released on bail. You see, they didn't they didn't um, go after him on child trafficking right there, you see? Anyway, Odyssey Foundation groomed teenage boys and young men from bus stations or because they were known to be homosexuals. These boys and young men, referred to as fellows, were photographed for booklets and trafficked to clients, referred to as sponsors, who paid for their company. The fellows are trafficked across the country, staying with sponsors for one to three days on average between traveling to the next sponsor. So, the funny thing about drugs and prostitution, and you can piggyback child pornography and prostitution on, on, on top of this, is that no matter what city you go to, my experience has been Atlanta and Portland. Wherever you find a rich area, okay, especially rich, richer, younger people, younger adults, you're going to find piggybacked alongside of that, near that area, some area that sells drugs and provides prostitution. It's always piggybacked near that area. And I'll give an example. Like in Portland, there's a nice little trendy kind of area that young, up and mobile rich people live. Um, it's northwest Portland. 18th, 21st, 23rd, 25th, 24th Avenue or street, whatever. A lot of trendy people live there. And piggybacked along that and it's always between the business core area and that area where they live so when they travel from that area from work to home they pass through this area along Burnside now Burnside from especially from the 405 highway all the way up to the West Hills was notorious for drug trafficking this is where that kid I saw got beaten by the police and prostitution you know we had I used to work at this pizza delivery place right there off of 18 and we would have this woman that would come and sit right in front of our restaurant in her little mini skirts she'd always get there about five six o'clock because that's when people were getting off work and she'd be out there no more than 10 minutes some guy would come by in a nice really nice car pick her up she'd be gone for a couple of hours two three hours later she'd come back same spot ten minutes later another guy would come by and pick her up we all knew what was going on I even took pictures of it you call the police they know what's going on they don't do anything same thing guy across the street selling drugs same thing just went on and on forever and in Atlanta you had the same thing there, especially back in the 80s. Peachtree Street, West, especially West Peachtree Street, was notorious for, you know, the Suchi Lounge, the Cameo Lounge, prostitutions running, you know, prostitution. Mike Thevis had a lot of his uh, pornography movie theaters in that area. And that was because it was along the way from the downtown core where people worked up to Buckhead where the rich people lived. So they would travel up Burnside, they'd pick up a prostitute, they'd go see some porno, pick up some pornography, whatever, and then they'd go home. And the same thing over off of Cheshire Bridge Road, very notorious area. I know this area very well because I lived off La Vista almost near Dru Druid Hills, and I'd have to pass through that area going to Piedmont so then I could turn right on Piedmont and go up 
to Tower Place where I was working. But there's a reason that that area, I don't know about today, was so notorious for, you know, prostitutes, drug activity, uh, porn theaters, uh, massage parlors, because that's where the clients would pass through. It's right off the highway. You could get the people going home to Gwinnett County. You could also get the people going from downtown to Buckhead. The people that lived over in, you know, suburban, um, you know, De- uh, DeKalb County. You didn't have prostitution and um, pornography theaters right across from Lenox Square. Okay? <laughs> There's a reason for that. It's called the Area of Passage. People would go through, and they would set up there because they knew it was, you know, not close to work, not close to home, but they they knew the clients would pass through there. That's what you had. So anyway, the Odyssey Foundation groomed teenage boys. I think I went through this already. The young boys and men were referred to as fellows, were photographed for booklets and trafficked the clients. Exactly what I just said referred to as sponsors who paid for their company. The fellows were trafficked across the country, staying with sponsors from one to three days on average before traveling to the next sponsor. Now, I don't think Wayne Williams ever got to that stage where he was sending these kids around the country because we would have heard about that. But there's nothing saying that he wasn't sending some of the boys to hotels because Atlanta's a big international airport right there. People could fly in, go to downtown to the hotels. He could send them clients, send them these boys, you know, make a little extra money that way. Or he could have just been sending them pornography. You know, using James Comento to do that. It's also interesting that James Comento lives right there off of Roxbury, right close to the not far from the Cheshire Bridge area there. Oh, another thing is this, the bomber who bombed uh, the Olympics and then he bombed an abortion clinic in Sandy, Sandy Springs. The next place he bombed was a uh, gay bar off of Cheshire Bridge in Piedmont. He left a bomb in the bar and blew it up. I think he didn't kill anybody, but he scared a bunch of people. That was... He was a neo-Nazi, and that was one of his protests that he was trying to, you know, go after that. Anyway, so this is what I think Wayne Williams is doing. He's making a portfolio. He's using Nova as uh, the auditions as an ex- a reason to get the kids in, because how else are you going to get these kids in? This is why he's paying radio time for advertising. He's going to their houses and uh, picking them up and taking them to the studio to audition. He's using the equipment in the studio so he can add that to the portfolio and then shop that around to his clients, exactly what John David Norman was doing. So the Delta Project. After being released in Dallas, Norman fled to Homewood, Illinois. See, he's gone another place, a a suburb of Chicago, in late August or early nine, September 1973, using the name Steve Gerwell, he began living with Charles Reeling, an Odyssey client um, from Homewood. Norman had previously trafficked a 16-year-old boy from Independence, Missouri to Reeling, who went on a trip to Europe with the boy. Now, another thing interesting I remember, when I was a cab driver, I had a couple of clients or a couple of people I'd pick up at these um, strip clubs and they're always uh, the strippers I had this one main stripper that she got a DUI couldn't drive so she needed to drive home and she was always stoned out of her mind or really messed up but anyway she would tell me about these new girls that would come in and how that worked there was basically a stripper circuit Okay, I had no idea about this, but I read about this and then 
She confirmed it what I which what she told me. There was a stripper circuit, okay? And so girls would go to there was a network loosely associated network of clubs that were you know, you'd have one guy in Georgia, Atlanta, that would own four or five clubs across the state. You'd have another guy in New York that would own four or five clubs across the state. Another guy in Portland or Oregon that would own a couple of strip clubs across Oregon and Washington. And so they networked with each other because they weren't in competition. Okay? And so you'd have a girl, she would strip in Portland for three, four months. And then after that, she would uh, fly down to Atlanta and she'd strip there. And they had these houses set up where, you know, a three bedroom house, whatever, was owned by the owner of the house. And, you know, each girl had her own bedroom, whatever. And sometimes they would bring home clients. So it wasn't just stripping, it was also prostitution. Now, whether the club owners are involved in that or it's just individual, I don't know. But this was a, a thing that went on. And it's still, it's still going on, okay? And these women, in order to not get caught by the police, they would move to another and they would, you know, hop around. Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas. You think of every city in the United States, there are strip clubs. And these girls are performing there, but some are also doing prostitution. So this is the same thing that we're talking about. And we're going to read here with this Delta project uh, that he actually set up or one of these projects that he did, he, yeah, cadets, that he'd have houses for the boys and clients would come over or he'd shop them out to clients, okay? And they had a place they could stay. And this is how it works. And if it worked that way with the, the, the strippers and the prostitutes, I'm sure it's working the same way in reverse for the male prostitutes, Okay. But it says, after being released in Dallas, Norm, uh, Norman fled to Homewood, Illinois. So, uh, anyway, I already went through this. During his time in Homewood, Homewood, Norman sexually abused 10 teenage boys, enticing them with beer, showing them pornography, and committing acts such as groping and oral sex upon them. Homewood police received an anonymous call on October 31st, 1973. Um, let's see. Stating that Steve Gerwell, Norman was sexually abusing boys. Norman was out of town by the time, but the police were able to locate Reeling, who assisted them in their investigation. Upon his return to Homewood, on November 14th, Norman was arrested and charged with five counts of indecent liberties with a child and eight counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. In the spring of 1976, while awaiting trial on charges related to the Homewood crimes, Norman was bailed out of Cook County Jail for $36,000 by an unknown person from California. Of course, he had a rich client that helped him out. In December 1976, he was sentenced to four years in prison and sent to Pontiac Correctional Center. Shortly before he was released on bail, Norman began his next sex operation, the Delta Project, and began uh, publishing a newsletter called Hermes. From... Cook County Jail, Norman sent out three new newsletters using the jail's printing press. Oh my God, he was running this from jail, claiming that the Delta Project aimed to provide educational travel and self-development opportunities for qualified young men of character and integrity. Oh, good Lord. And that Delta dorms, see, right there, were established across the U.S. with each dorm having two or four cadets overseen by a Don. See, it's exactly what I was talking about with that stripper was telling me about these stripper houses that were set up all across the U.S. A police alleged that the cadets were underage male prostitutes recorded in, uh, recruited in Chicago. In May 1977, interview with the Tribune, Norman denied the uh, Delta Project was sexual in nature and claimed to have sent the newsletter to over 7,000 people. At the time of the interview, police said the newsletter had 5,000 subscribers and grossed over 300,000 per year from jail. Oh my God, wow. Norman was paroled in the fall of 1977. See, so he's only in jail like a year, less than a year. Okay? 
But again, he's arrested, what, less than a year later for having sex with two underage boys from a local foster home and taking pornographic pictures of both. One of the boys informed investigators that Norman was in the process of selling him to a client and he, Norman, was simply waiting for his plane ticket. You see? Norman was accused of refounding the Delta Project, now called the Creative Core, and MC Publications after being released from prison and operating it out of his apartment at 685 and a half West Wrightwood Avenue, allegedly sending photos of boys to a Don in Canada. In a raid on the apartment, 20,000 pink index cards, or possibly 50 to 100,000, containing the names of customers were found. You see? So that's what he does. He gets together these, he uh, grooms children, takes photographs of them, sends out in a portfolio, and then not only is he sending out the pornography, but he's also shopping these kids out and prostituting them out. All right. And it continues. Between October 1983 and May 1984, Norman produced a published a child pornography magazine called Handy Andy from his rural home in nearby motel in Astros, Pennsylvania. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but you remember when um, uh, Michael Jackson's home was raided, okay? They went in with a warrant on that charge of child exploitation that he wasn't convicted of. They found catalogs or magazines of children, boys, in sexually... Uh, exploitive poses, none of them were naked, but in underwear, in bathing suits, things like that. So that's how someone like Norman would shop around to his clients, these rich clients, doing these things, okay? Anyway, let's see. Um, Norman fled Pennsylvania. See, there he goes again. He fled Pennsylvania after his home was raided on May 31st, 1984, and was captured in Bolingbrook, Illinois, in October 1984. He was released on bail uh, March 1985 and promptly fled again. See? Norman was captured in August 1987, so he's out for three years without getting caught, and giving a six-year prison sentence for his crimes in Illinois. He was later extradited to Pennsylvania and sentenced 18 months to 36 months in prison for charges related to Handy Andy. A 1986 news report focused on Handy Andy and stated that Norman was wanted in five different states for child sex crimes. All right, later crimes. Norman was convicted of child molestation. So, again, you may have these rich clients all over the country, these rich people on his client list, and Wayne Williams may be sending stuff to the same list, okay? The same group of people, or some of the same groups of people. They may overlap, but John David Norman and Wayne Williams may never have known each other. All right. It says Norman was convicted of child molestation in Colorado in 1988 in distributing child pornography in California in 1995 and 1998. He was released from prison in California in 1999, but was declared a sexually violent predator and detain, detained indefinitely at a Tuscadero State Hospital. See? That's what I'm saying. Three times, throw away the key. Throw them in prison forever because they're never going to change psychologically. They're damaged. And they're always going to be continuing to do the same things. Okay? He was eventually released from a Tuscadero to the rural town of Boulevard, California, under strict conditions. Good Lord. On February 2nd, 2009, Norman violated those conditions by uh, giving a note containing his contact information to a 19-year-old grocery bagger in El Centro. Now, let's just think about this. 2009 minus 1937. So he's 72 years old, and he's giving his contact information to a 19-year-old boy. In March 2009, he was ordered back into state custody, this time to Kalinga State Hospital. He died in 2011. You know, they should have just, after the third time, back in the 60s or 70s, 
they should have just kept them in prison forever because they're never going to change they're never going to get any better it, it's impossible alright possible connections to Dean Coral of Norm following Norman's 1973 arrests in Dallas news reports indicated police were investigating if he had any ties to serial killer Dean Coral Coral murdered at least 28 teenage boys and young men in Houston uh, between 1970 and 1973 Coral himself was killed on August 8, 1972, by his accomplice, um, Elmer Wayne Henley. And I just read that Elmer Wayne Henley just died, I believe, of COVID, like two years ago. Just days before Norman's arrest. Norman had previously lived in Houston, as evidenced by his 1954 and 1956 arrests there. Additionally, the sources were tipped off the police about the Odyssey Foundation and was a prostitute involved in the organization got scared after an unidentified man in Houston requested her services. Henley gave a statement to the police following uh, Curl's death in which he stated that Curl claimed to be involved with the Dallas-based organization that brought boys and sold boys, ran whores and drops and stuff like that. Police stated that he did not think Curl's other accomplice, David Owens Brooks, was involved with Odyssey. Um, but also did not rule out Coral and Henley as being involved, though they stated they had no evidence connecting them to uh, Norman's organization. In 1975, however, Houston police reported finding pictures depicting even Coral's victims. Eleven of Coral's victims during a raid of trial prostitution ring once again raised the possibility of connections to uh, Norman. Let's also not forget that the Green River Killer, who did killed for like 20 years before he was finally caught with DNA evidence, um, possibly killed up to 93 people, women, and most of those were involved in prostitution. Now, most of them were like, you know, drug addicts, and they call they call them lot lizards. They would go around to the truck stops and knock on the doors and say, "You want company?" and stuff like that. But it could be a connection there. Norman is also alleged to have been connected to another serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. Gacy murdered at least 33 teenage boys and young men in Chicago between 1972 and 1978. Uh, and this is how I, I found out about Norman. A May 1977 report from the Chicago Tribune stated that Norman's closest associate in the running the Delta Project was a 25-year-old convicted murderer named Philip Paskey. Known for his violent streak, Paskey... Um, was implicated in several thefts and murders, and most notably the, the latter being three boys killed in 1977, one of which was said to testify against Norman. The link between Paskey and Norman was made when it was discovered they shared a post office box they used for distributing Norman's newsletters, which Paskey helped facilitate. In August 1977, the Tribune outed Paskey when he was found out that he worked for the city of Chicago as a lifeguard. Good Lord. Paskey was described as being tall, blonde, having bad complexion, and often dressed as a woman due, his, due to his transvestitism. And again, let's not forget that Wayne Williams was seen dressing like a woman quite a bit. He died in 1998. Police alleged that Paskey had taken over the running the Delta Project from Norman, was sent to prison. He also uh, was also at Norman's apartment during Norman's arrest in 1978. Wow. The Paskey himself was not arrested. Arrested. Paskey had worked for Gacy's construction company, PDM Contractors. Good Lord. Gacy implicated Paskey, Norman, and two other PDM employees as his accomplices in murder in 1992. Interview. Casey claimed Norman and the Delta Project were producing snuff films of young boys. Exactly. Exactly what I'm talking about there, folks. Possibly including some of Gacy's victims. At least two victims believed to have been murdered by Gacy. Uh, Kenneth Parker and Michael Marino had had last been seen alive close to where Norman lived. So, again, that brings us back to Wayne Williams and his murder spree. Were the murder sprees his anger at not being able to get these kids in a singing group and a record deal? Was it his anger over just hating poor black kids 
because they made him look bad as a, a smart white uh, black kid? Or was it more than that? Were they snuff films for his possible, you know, rich elite clients? And maybe that's why none of this was prosecuted for the children because if they had opened up that door through discovery, let's just think about this, okay? So all the files that the police had, if they had opened up that door and the FBI files, everything that was used in the prosecution, if they had gone after Wayne Williams for the murder of all 30 victims, 25, 26 of them were children. All that investigative information, everything, all the witness statements, all the evidence that they had in that Atlanta Police Department warehouse and all the FBI documents, would they have exposed this Delta Project-like Network in Atlanta that Wayne Williams may have been involved in because this is what would happen. All those files would be copied and given over to Wayne Williams' attorney as discovery. Okay? And then, as his attorney worked through the files, they would have come across interviews, names, dates, places that they could expand the case and create enough doubt that no, Wayne Williams didn't kill him. He was just taking pictures. It was these clients of his, these rich elite clients of his that were killing the children. Think about that. And then all those people's names even if they just, all they did was just order pictures, would now be exposed. And maybe some of these people were big donors for Mayor Jackson. Maybe some of these people were involved in the police force. Maybe some of these people were involved with, in the Atlanta elite aristocracy in Buckhead, in Northwest Atlanta. Maybe... That's why they only stuck to the two adults because to expose all that information in discovery would give Wayne Williams' attorneys enough ability to create enough doubt that, no, no, my client, all he did was he just took pictures of the kids. He didn't kill them. Yeah, they were at his house. That's why they have the threads on the... They have the fibers because he brought them to his house and he took pictures, and that's all he did. And he took them back home or he took them to a client, and the client killed them. Or maybe the client contacted them later and killed them. Wine Williams had no idea this was going on. Can't you see this possibility? Now, I personally believe that Wayne Williams did kill his children. But just like in the OJ trial, a good attorney with all that information from Discovery could create enough doubt, especially if you've got your own private investigator like Chet Diggler running around with all these names of clients, knocking on doors and interviewing people. They could create enough doubt that... When Williams could walk and that all these people's names would be out in the media. So to me, and especially if Slayton, the DA and the mayor, they don't have enough evidence to convict anyone on the client list and their friends of his, why open up that can of worms, right? Why? So this is why I'm going over this Norman guy and his Delta project because I think Wayne Williams either had his own little mini version of the Delta project or was providing 
you know, because none of these guys work in a vacuum. They're not competitive. They would get client lists from other people in other places. They would get portfolio lists from all over the country and shop that out. So this is what I think was going on. And that opens up a whole new can of worms. Personally, I think Wayne Williams killed them. Either out of anger or his snuff films. But it could be that one of these clients or a couple of these clients were killing them. Maybe even using Wayne Williams. You keep bringing me clients or you're going to find yourself floating in that goddamn Chattahoochee River. little fat chubby boy because you're nobody I got power I got creds in this town okay I can snap my finger and you disappear maybe that's what Wayne Williams is dealing with maybe he knows that those same people could kill him very easily in prison. It wouldn't take much, a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand, couple of do- couple thousand dollars, distributed among two or three guys in prison, and Wayne Williams shanked in the the hallway or shanked in the prison yard. It wouldn't take much. You open your mouth. You mention my name, you're a dead man, Wayne Williams. That's the message that we get through from these rich elite clients. Now, whether they killed the boys or Wayne Williams killed the boys, I lean towards Wayne Williams killed them. Whether they were molesting the boys or just getting pictures, I don't know. There's another factor going on here. You got to think, why didn't they prosecute for the other 28? Because those 28 lead back to the rich elite in Atlanta and across the U.S. And so they left that door closed and just stuck to the adults that was, they could definitely link to Wayne Williams. Now, is Slayton in on the whole thing? I don't think so. Was Mayor Young in on the whole thing with the rich elites? No, but I'm sure you got a, little, a couple of phone calls late at night. Let's not forget, when, uh, Mr. Young, when you were with that little boy in that hotel room, we have pictures of that. So let's not forget that, okay? You sure would hate to have those pictures come out. I'm not saying that happened, but I'm just saying that's definitely a way to control someone. There was a key. I can't remember exactly, but I remember hearing in a, a video, there was a key found on one of the boys or in his possessions that was killed that was linked to a hotel, a hotel room where Maynard Jackson had been staying. Was he blackmailed? Who knows? All I can say is there's definitely was more going on here than Wayne Williams angry about a bunch of poor white uh, black kids not able to get a goddamn record deal together. Okay? All right, so we're going to continue on John David Norman in the next video. I'm going to go through all the information that I have on him, which is quite a bit, and but I'm not going to read through everything. I'm just going to stop the camera read until I find something interesting I'll turn the camera on and then we'll turn it off so we'll do that and then um, we'll continue all right take care